how are you? Good, you? <laughs> good, good, good. Uh, it's early. I don't have my normal voice yet. I can, I can tell. I still have my morning voice. Yeah. Well, I've been up since for three hours. I know. So. Just a little deeper than usual. Yeah. Sounds like I might have a cold, but I don't. Yeah. Tired. Late night. Yeah, late night. Yep. Yep. We're back to grind time. You know, it's funny because now this will be the third summer doing the podcast. So people that have I been. I can't believe that. I know. So people that have been with us since the beginning. Yeah. This will be the third time they hear us talk about the grind time because it's yeah. now the grind time again. Yeah. Crazy how fast it goes. Yeah. And slow, but fast. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I had an interesting observation is not the right word, but okay. something. I was listening to a podcast last night, uh, Joe Rogan. Yeah. Do you know who Sean Strickland is? Give me a second, Sean Strickland. Is he a... It's fighter. Yeah, UFC. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he fights anyone. It fights anyone. Yeah. So he was on the podcast. Yeah. It has nothing to do with fighting. So he, the guy's talking, and I like I like the Joe Rogan podcast because he just it's everybody, anyone yeah. can be on there. Like I listened to one where he was talking to this guy that's an expert on mushrooms. Yeah. It's like so cool, yeah. right? So it's all across the spectrum. So, anyways, this guy was on, and now that I do some of the role stuff it's interesting to hear because i actually know what they're talking about now so anyways he just won a fight recently and he was on and the mouth on this guy okay was like the most off-putting it's the most off-putting like thing every second word was a swear no yeah just like everything's a swear but then just like he's one of these shit talker guys Okay. And I, I don't necessarily mind the shit talky stuff because I get like you're trying to sell your fights and whatever, but this is not really the environment for that necessarily. Right. Like right. you're just on the podcast talking. Yeah. So it's, you don't have to be like in character per se every second. Mm -hmm. So like Con Conor McGregor is like that, but you can kind of tell like when he's not on camera doing his thing he can t talk like a normal person it's not old, like 100 percent shit talk for his whole life so <laughs> i don't need the glasses no, right now we're just yet. talking no uh, so anyways i was it just got me thinking like i'm trying to fight through listening to this podcast and i'm so distracted by the mouth on this guy and to throw the caveat like I've, i don't care i have nothing against you can talk however you want but like and he had a really rough upbringing, lived in a rough t town, rough place, rough family life, or whatever, something along those lines. And now as an adult, it just seems inexcusable to me that this is how you're speaking on a platform like that, particularly, like you're not in the garage with your buddies, like just shooting, shooting the shit. And so it was just, it was a, an interesting little, not really a lesson, but something I just wanted to point out to people is like, if you don't it's so easy to like just let your mouth run and speak without thinking about what you're saying, who you're saying it to, how you're saying it. And that doesn't mean you can never throw a swear word out. I'm not saying you have to talk like you're a professor every, every second, but just knowing the audience and knowing who you're around and knowing who might hear you. And I think it's a really good lesson for kids too, because so many times you just will walk by a, a pack of kids and you can just hear you know, even walking through the lobby, there's the skate park is just around the corner from the rink here. And so a lot of those kids will come over here and they're, they just are yelling and screaming, obnoxious, loud, swearing. And they say, you have, you're in a public place with all kinds of people around and just unaware of how you're speaking. So anyways, it just brought kind of that whole topic back to mind because I'm listening to this grown man who's pr probably at the peak of his career at the moment and how many people he's just like, turning off that won't even listen to what he has to say about anything just because of the how he talks you know and it's it's for, i mean for him he probably doesn't give a shit at all that probably doesn't matter but still worth pointing out like he'd probably be better off if he cleaned it up a little bit to a certain degree way more people would actually be like be on your side and and you know want to see you do well and succeed but just because this total stranger i don't know wants to yap like that it's just it's such a turn off and it's something that I pick up on frequently, even just with people that I talk to uh, outside of that environment. So yeah. it's just an interesting thing. Well, it's interesting. And, and you know what else is interesting? We left here yesterday, Charlie and I, after the workout, and we got out the parking lot here. 
and I said, hey, because uh, we're going somewhere today. And uh, I said, I wonder if, uh, I, I don't want to say because whatever, but I wonder if this guy's going to be there. Um, and he goes, yeah, I wonder if he's going to say anything totally inappropriate. Charlie, right? And nothing, there's not a whole lot that offends him. It, it, not offensive, just like, so just as you say that, it's like, you know, those are the conversations Charlie and I have all the time. It's like, you got to know your audience, man. And, uh, so like this, this guy, we're sitting around, I don't want to say where yet. Um, we're sitting around and, uh, Oh, Charlie, what are you doing this summer? Oh, I'm going to be working with my dad and all that stuff too. And training. And then he said something like just totally, totally, totally inappropriate, but like, you can't offend me. You can't offend yeah, Charlie. That's not the point. That's not yeah. the point. Right. It was just like, okay. So there's a difference between like knowing your audience so that wasn't it wasn't even dressing room talk and he's not a hockey guy so it doesn't that, that it, 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 that's what probably made it weirder and i'm like that's how you talk like most of the time like that's weird yeah. so i was saying that to charlie like like as, as as players like right like there's a there's dressing room talk and that gets like way out of hand not in a bad way it's just that's the environment yeah. but like you can't take your dressing room talk and go to uh anywhere public or even a family event and talk the same, speak the same way and expect people to laugh or to get it because it's not that environment. Right. And, um, and, and so we had a little talk about that and it's, it's so funny. Like cause some people just don't get it. Mm -hmm. and I had like, I had the same conversation. I remember with one of the classes I teach, it was a grade sevens, grade sevens or grade eight kids. And I remember having the exact, I had this conversation because I can hear it when, before I'm out, when they're just like in the gym screwing around before we start the class, like I'm right here, I can hear what they're saying, you know, even though I'm not engaged or we're not engaged with each other. And I remember brought, brought them in because they're, they're saying things that they know they shouldn't be saying just because it's, it's fun and it's cool. It's and it's not the classroom. It's, yeah, it's yeah. Right. And you, you know, you think you can get away with it. And there's just something about trying to find that line of what can I say? How far can I push it when you're around that young age? And so I told him, because I don't care how anyone talks. Like, if you want to swear, if you want to say any inappropriate thing, go for it. It doesn't matter to me, but it should matter to you. Because if somebody hears that, then automatically they make a snap judgment of you. And you don't know who that person is that could give you an opportunity or take one away or whatever. And so for a lot of these kids, when they're in here, they love being in here and they think it's a cool place and, and, and all that. They look forward to coming here. And so I said to them, I was like, well, what if you want to work here one day? And all I remember of you is your stupid mouth that this kid couldn't get his mouth together because of whatever reason, you know? And so it's just a, it's a good lesson for the young kids. And it's a good lesson for adults too, because even in your little adult circle, you know, you start shit talking one of the other parents or another kid or whatever. And people remember, like they don't, they know what you said, or why would you say something like that? Or why are you talking about this particular topic in front of everybody or whatever? things that make people uncomfortable and it doesn't even have to be swearing. It's just like certain, certain topics that make you sound stupid. Like another one that does it for me was when people talk about money all the time. Oh, I had that, one two weeks ago. Did you? Oh, I was sitting there. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> just like, it's just one of those topics where it's like, no one cares yeah. about like yeah. how much money you have or don't, or yeah. like how much things that you bought cost, or it's just an off putting conversation for a lot of people. And it's, and it has nothing to do with the foul mouth thing, but it's the same kind of principle. It's just like, what? Like, shut up. You know what I mean? And so you have to have some awareness around that because you can run, your mouth can run you into some problems, man. Oh, yeah. You well, know? I, my wife, a lot of the time, she goes, hey, Andy, she, I could see she's trying to get me to tell a story. She goes, and, I, and especially if there's more than like, like a handful of people or more, it's like, nah, nah. I, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 she, no, just say it. And I, I, no, no, no. Yeah, it's, it's, know, not just, the, it's, it's not just it's not the setting it, it won't be funny it's not the setting yeah. it's i can't be as colorful as i'd like to be right exactly <laughs> it's just not the setting and yeah as i said i don't if i'm going to be funny i want to be funny not kind of like uh-huh uh, yeah 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 exactly uh, that's a good one yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> funny you know. so anyways i thought that was a good uh start and it kind of gets what's well, funny uh, just to add to that yeah it's funny because uh i'll throw on the odd uh podcast here and there as well and I, when I when I do a hockey podcast, it's so funny, like how a lot of the times a guy, a guy will be a guest. You go, oh, this this guy will be good. Like he should be good, good, good career, seem like a good guy. And they do the podcast, and they're just vanilla. 
they just they, they just they talk like they're talking on a hockey night in Canada interview and you could just see the host going like okay so like you know can you can you live it up something. a little bit yeah. and, and that's not the guy's fault right it's not the guy not the guest fault that's like it's more of on the podcast host to engage him maybe prep him before and say like do you feel like like are you going to be vanilla or is this going to be can you talk a little bit and get animated and you know maybe maybe the principle behind it is maybe to teach kids or to teach players or to give fans a, an idea of what something's really like and when they're just vanilla it's like wow hard on the guest but you know that's again reading the room right yeah and and that's kind of the 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 my point of bringing that up is just you're like i said before your mouth can run into problems so just be aware of who you're talking to who you're talking around what are you saying and just have a second thought about it and that oddly enough kind of ties into the topic we're going to be talking about today um because we're going to start well we're going to start another series about coaching and this is going to kind of springboard off the one we did about parenting because we got a lot of good feedback about that one and uh so now we're going to kind of flip it around to coaching but it's very similar to parenting we're going to touch on different topics but even starting on that like your communication style with your team as a coach is something that can totally make or break even if you're the best coach ever if you if you talk like an idiot or you can't communicate properly or you cannot get the kids to buy into the things that you're saying then your your strategy you're going to lose you know so it's a very important thing to to keep your mouth in check and and have a, some self awareness about it so um with that we're going to do it's going to be like another six episode kind of thing and we're going we're going to talk about um kind of all things coaching so I don't know if you have want to start with any um, maybe opening thoughts, just like s- summary about like what you want to, what kind of the stuff you want to talk about or why you think it's important um, or what we're trying to do, like outline going through these kind of, yeah. these kind of things. Yeah. Um, basically, if, if anyone's looking for X's and O's and uh, systems and all that kind of stuff, there'd be very, very, very little of that. It's more along like my experiences uh, through playing type of coaches I've had and type of coaches that have been effective. Uh, maybe some of the t- coaches that have changed to be effective still, like wh- why that's happened. Um, but more, more along the lines of, um, you know, like, uh, you know, some f- for coaches that have never had a team before or, or struggling to communicate like that along those lines. Um, so not X's and O's mostly like communication skills, deal with parents, how to, how to make plans and stuff like that. Um, we're going to cover like, depending on the age, you know, how, how do you approach kids there? Like what type of seriousness do you have or what type of, um, fun or what kind of message are you bringing to the kids and the, and the people, um, identifying your team, um, like what, like what level, what, what type of team do you have? Like, so how, how do you coach in a situation where maybe you got a really ultra talented team? And maybe you have a situation where you have um, like just it's, there's no talent at all, and you got to do something different. Uh, are you coaching to make players better? Are you coaching to teach them life lessons? Um, just different things like that. Coaching the team, coaching individuals, coaching uh, in a practice, but coaching in a game. Do you talk a lot in a game? Do you don't? Stuff like that. Like just coaching cues for stuff like that. And the other one would be like kind of like dealing for dealing with conflicts. Mm-hmm. Cool. So 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 I think I'm gonna when we do like through the episodes and even in this one, just kind of setting the stage for it, I'm going to more ask you like, as from the coaching side of it, what you're like, what you think or what you've done or what's been effective versus not in each of those kind of areas. And I think that the first one that people probably may or may not ask as coaches, because I, I mean, with coaches that I've come across or talked to, it seems like they don't necessarily ask a lot of these questions. Um, and the first one, it seems like a very simple question, but it'd be like, why, why do you coach? Like, what's the point? What are you trying to do? You know? And so like, if, if you were to say, give your reason as a coach, like, and, and it could be different depending on the age or whatever, but if taking that out of it, just as a, as a human, if you're going to coach at any team at any level, why, why would you personally, Andy be doing it? Like, what is the, what is the reason behind that for you? Yeah. Well, are you asking me like for my stage of life and the whole bit? Sure. Like if like you're, you'll be like one example and then yeah. we can kind of generalize it from there. Yeah. Well, I could give you a couple actually. The first time I ever coached was at the, in the OHL level. 
And the reason I did it is because I was fresh out of playing and I wanted to stay in the game. And the general manager, Sam McMaster, for the Sudbury Wolves at the time, he said, anytime that you want a coach, come and see me because I think you'd make a great coach. And then he went on. He was a general manager for uh, Los Angeles Kings. And now I, I think he's done scouting now, but he was with Washington for a long time and Columbus. And um, so I had uh, I, I thought that I would love to get into coaching. I was, was fairly young and make a career out of that. Um, so I was an assistant coach the first uh, first couple of years and, and, and I loved it. But I didn't I don't think I was ready to coach. Um, and maybe I was immature. Maybe I was just looking at that as a career because that's all I knew was hockey. And, you know, it's like the next step everybody wants to coach, right? If you talk to a guy that just got out of the NHL, what's your next step? Is like, oh, I'll coach. It's like, there's a lot of, yeah, it's hard to get a coaching job, to be honest with you. But it's, and, and, and coaching is not as simple as people think, especially the higher levels, because now you're coaching for money and wins. So anyways, I took that and then I got out of it because I was still somewhat close in age to some of the guys. Um, and I, I didn't have the same philosophy as the head coach. I, 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 I was looking at things a lot differently. So, and, and being second fiddle, you got to go with toe the line and that's fine. Um, but I didn't really care for the message. And, um, and then I, I just, I, I guess I got sick of hockey. So that's the first stint I had. I loved it and I had good, um, loved part of it. And then I didn't like some of it because I just kind of wanted to kind of get out of hockey at that point. So I was going to ask, so, cause you said you don't think you were ready to yeah. coach. Yeah. So I don't know if maybe I'll touch on that again. If when you keep well, talking, I, no, I, can, answer I can do that right now. Yeah. I, I think what I mean by I wasn't really ready is I, I didn't know or didn't, didn't know. I, I guess I was, I think what, what, what didn't help me is that the, uh, the coach, the head coach at the time didn't have a real, like a, a legit plan. He didn't have like a real philosophy. It was just, uh, I mean, this is this is in the '90s, right? So, uh, and that's fine. He's a head coach. Do what you want. But it was never we sat down and went through that, and and said, "Here's here's responsibilities." It was just got everybody kind of winging it. So it was less structured, um, which which is fine. Um, but I don't think I was ready because I think I still wanted to play. Uh, you know what I mean? I I knew that there there was times where I just I, I think I want to go back out and play. So it was that, and I think I needed to live life a little bit to see something outside of hockey. Actually, really to get my passion back to coach. And not that I wanted to go into coaching, I just wanted to get a passion for for some other area of life, try life out, and then maybe get some experience. So then that led me into working in the real world for probably four or five years. And yeah, five years, six years. And um given that a go and not having the passion. So that was my biggest thing is I, I didn't, I couldn't get real passionate about real life work. Does that make sense? And that might seem like, Oh, what, what a yeah, hockey guys only know hockey. No, that's not what it is because I, I, for me, I was like, I loved hockey. I loved everything about it, learning it and stuff like that. So when, when I, I got, a, I got, a, I got excited about, getting back in the hockey world and and um through through a few connections i just started doing hockey clinics and you know i was going up to toronto a little bit and doing some clinics up there and i said this is what i want to do and what i wanted to do so this leads into why i would ever coach kind of is and this is my philosophy now like a lot of people say you run a hockey business or you are a hockey instructor or trainer and i i that's the vehicle i use to do what i love well, what I love to do is make people better. And I would say that outside of hockey, that's what I like to do. Like when people talk about their jobs and all that kind of stuff, I kind of go to solution driven or purpose driven solutions to help people. Uh, I'm not trying to look like a philanthropist here, yeah. <laughs> but but that's where, that's my go-to. It's like yeah, trying yeah. to make people better, try to find the good in people. So like if you were, if you were, you know, you talk to me about something, it's like, well, I think I think here's your skill sets and here's where you're good and it's like lifting people up more or less. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, Would you agree sure. with that? It's kind of like leaving, uh, you want to leave the place better than you found it or leave yeah. the person better than you found them kind yeah. of idea. Yeah, so my best vehicle for that was hockey. So when as I started doing clinics, I, I fell in love with the process of, okay, I've got to, I, I see you on the ice. I, I actually enjoyed the process of selling it at first because it was, uh, when I moved down to this area, nobody knew me. 
So I came down here and I, I, you know, I was somewhat marketing my stuff and people were laughing at me like, well, who's this guy? There's a million hockey schools around here, hockey training, but I had a different idea. So I, I knew that I was, I could get something. So I started off on a small scale and then very quickly, the better players like, found you, yeah. yeah, like Ryan Wilson, who played in the NHL, uh, what's his name? Uh, Kyle Wellwood, guys like that started Ryan Donnelly and, and it came, became like a high end stuff, but it was more like very small groups and here's what I see, here's how we can fix things, right? So that was a great challenge. I love doing that. Then you can have good communication and stuff. But at the end of the day, um, it was always about making the player a better player. And I got a lot of joy out of that. So that led me into do, building my business. And then it was presented to me when I was in the States training um, a lot of a lot of kids and particularly one area, one age group and one one team. And one day it just slipped. I said out loud because it was like a true statement that I made. I said, I said to the manager of the team, I said, I'd love to coach these kids, man. They're just great kids. I love them. I love them. And then I got in my car and my phone was ringing off the hook. Yeah, with yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah all that stuff. Yeah. And I said, no, I'll, I, and then I thought about it. I said, no, I would love to coach these guys. So then I, I coached them and I, I absolutely loved it. So why did I do that one? It was for love, love of, love of the game. That's for me, it was love of the game and teaching kids. Right. And then, and then my, when I coached with, uh, when I coached Charlie for a couple of years, when he was very young, it was, the coaching was, uh, like non-existent obviously eight years old seven eight years old and um i was considering bringing him you know i was talking to a couple of buddies having a beer in the parking lot like a normal dad does eh? <laughs> your best ideas come when you're half pissed um and i said yeah i think next year we're gonna go to triple a like get, get some coaching a little bit anyways and then they just said why don't you coach and i was like nah, i don't want to but but then again they, they convinced me just do it and i said okay and that was my thing. It was like to make the kids better. It wasn't I wasn't trying to be a pro. Right, right. So it was to be is is to make the kids learn the game of hockey. But every single day, in my, um, in my coaching with them, I would give them a message. You know, it might be something like, like I like you know me. I walk around and and I see something that could be inspiring, and I use that as something for, for the kids. So like it was. Well, I remember one day it was the playoffs and they were starting their playoffs and I, you know, I said, how can I relate something? And I didn't want to work out that day. So, um, one of the people that worked, worked, had a kid on the team. Um, I said, let's, let's have a really hard workout today. She went, okay. So then I went to the, to the, before the game. And that was my message. I said, you know what guys, like this is going to be hard things that you got to do. And there's jobs on the ice that you don't want to do or are reluctant or scared or whatever you don't feel like it. I said, that's what I had today. I said, you know what? If I put a hard workout on here, then I've done something, um, <clears throat> sorry, uncomfortable. And now I can ask the kids to do something uncomfortable. I said it in a, you know, more motivating way and they got fired up, right? So I always have a message for them every day and I pull kids aside. And that's what made me happy to see a, a kid that maybe wasn't even a good hockey player at all or an average hockey player just become a little bit better and have a smile on his face and say, Oh, coach likes me because I did this or whatever. That's why I liked coaching. Yeah. So if we can kind of Long general, answer. yeah, no, but it's good okay. because it's good to you. Cause you walked right through like the full evolution of kind of how your mindset yeah. ended up settling yeah. on. Yeah. I just like making people better. And that's kind well, of the root of the, and just to, and sorry, I don't mean to cut you off, but now that you're saying that, and the reason that I don't want to coach anymore. So, the, so that's, that's, yeah, that's why I coach. Answer, yeah. And the reason I don't want to coach anymore is because I don't want to deal with number one parents at all. And I don't want, like, and if I was to do it at a professional level, like you'd have to do, or like, I mean, OHL or junior or something like that, you'd really have to make it worth my while to put up with like doing all the video. Cause it's a lot of work. So at this point in my life, I have no interest in coaching a team because I could not handle parents right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I got, I, I get that. And sure. I just only want to make kids better. The kids that want to get better. So if we kind of generalize it out now, cause most people that are coaching and if we go like knock it down to youth hockey, obviously, uh, they have their job already and it's not a hockey business. So let's, let's say that, you know, you were talking about finding your passion because your passion was with hockey and then finding it using that as the vehicle, whatever. But a lot of people don't have that. Their, their passion is whatever they do. Or let's in, let's put in the best light. They're actually passionate about their job because a lot of people aren't even that. But let's say they are. So now, 
if one of them are if so, one of those types of people are going to decide to coach because that's most parents right moms or dads that are coaching the team so how do you bring that that kind of why into that environment when maybe they're not that passionate about coaching per se or hockey per se or would you say you shouldn't be in that role unless you do have some kind of a passion for it that's that, that's number one and then the second question you can kind of tail it however you want is how do you balance the like how much of your desire to coach would be because like your kids on the team versus you just want to be a coach that's the other kind of question because a lot of, a lot of parent parent coaches are just that they have a kid that's on the team so those kind of the two yeah. two yeah. things well i don't know if i don't know if uh passion for hockey is necessary at the young levels or at any level like i don't know i i there's got to be some reason that you would want to coach and I think you're right at the early, early stages, you're getting dads or moms behind the bench that are coaching because someone's got to do it. And they maybe have a little bit of a background in hockey, might be a good background in hockey, might not be. Um, but I think if you're going to do it, you have to have some reason to do it. Obviously, besides the obvious that you need a coach. Um, so I think that if you're going to do it, you have to look at, you have a team that you're like a team. And what is a team? A team is made up of maybe in youth hockey, 12 to 18 individuals. And uh, those individuals are playing hockey because they love hockey. So I don't think it's fair to just show up 10 minutes before practice and run the same drills and not have a plan or anything because these kids whether they're superstars or they're not or they're playing house league hockey at seven years old they want something more than they need no i shouldn't say they want they need something more than just here's your practice see you later alligator right so i think it's important that you do have some passion and and um or purpose and and to me the younger you are i think it's more important that you're you you you're you're a people builder rather than an X's and O's guy, obviously. Um, so I think that's very, very important to me. And then as far as parent coaches go, I mean, that's, that's, I think a lot, most people do do the coaching because they're parents. And, but now there's a, there's a different type of parent that coaches. There's one that is coaching. Like I've seen, we, you've seen this too, a lot of times where parents cannot let one thing go. Like the, at, at some point the, it's above their head or maybe it's not like the, the skill level or the talent level. They never played at that level or whatever. And their kids are good, whatever, it doesn't matter. And they just cannot let one day go by without yeah. them being on the ice <laughs> with them. And that's yeah. the crazy, yeah. crazy dad guy. Right. But I mean, we need coaches that, that are parent coaches, especially on the early, on the early part of coaching, right. In the yeah. early years. So well, I think one thing that I noticed, like I got one of my, my godson, his dad coaches there hockey team and it's for basically for that reason it's like we need someone to coach and he likes hockey like the dad likes hockey and whatever he's into it and i don't know like i'd have to ask him but i feel like i would know the answer but the reason he coaches is that like we need somebody to coach and he doesn't necessarily have a purpose to it or uh, whatever it's like you know i think about my practice we go there and he's good with the kids and all that but i think just adding a little a, like you said a little element of purpose to it or a little element of intention to it. And it doesn't have to be that much of a commitment either, right? Like it takes five minutes to think of a, like what's my goal today or what's my purpose for today or whatever. Like that's doesn't that's not a lot of commitment uh, if you're going to be a coach. So I think my, my point bringing that up is kind of what you're saying. If you're going to coach, even if it is just because you need someone to do it and it's a pain in your ass, if you're going to do it, you may as well have a good whack at it and do a good job. You know, like you have to go there anyways, you have to be there anyways. So find, if you're not super passionate about hockey and making people better per se, then I said that a lot today, per it's se, okay. um, mind. find a reason, you know, find a reason. It could just be like, all right, like I'm just want to make the kids better skaters. That's all I can contribute. Or I just want to make sure the kids have fun. You know, I just want to, I want to have them enjoy being here. Maybe the, maybe you don't make them better at all, but you just give them a good experience. It's yeah, like, and that all depends on levels. Exactly, right? right? So just yeah. have a, obviously, age-appropriate, level-dependent, but find something that can drive um, 
that can drive you while you're there. You have to be there anyways. You know what yeah, I mean? Well, it's like, I think the important thing for me is that, like I said earlier, is you've got 12 to 18 kids that you're kind of responsible for. And I think you're, I think if nothing else, you're there to make them have a good experience. You know, if, uh, yeah, I think I would, that's at, at any level, you know, try to be honest and kids look up to coaches or they tend to look up to coaches. Like you've seen this man, a guy that's never coached a game in his life, maybe never even played a game in his life, but that's my coach. Like it's, you, you, you gain, I don't know if it's a fear or a respect or something along those lines that a co- like especially a little kid sees their coach and they, that, that coach is everything. And they know they, everything. Yeah. And that oh, coach yeah. is judging me or he's given to encourage me or say nothing to me. And it's a, it's a very, very important role when you're a coach to do your best to mm-hmm. give good, good feedback or whatever it is yeah. to kids. Yeah, absolutely. Hey guys, my name is David. For the last roughly year or so, I've been a member of the PowerTech podcast, and I've trusted Eric and Andy to help me as a hockey dad, raising my kids and trying to figure out the answers. I don't have all the answers, and it's a great source of information, and it's an area where I feel comfortable leaning on to help me make better decisions. With that said, one thing I do know about is supplements. I find it's hard to navigate the whole supplement world and make sure that you're using products that work, that are effective, and again, are science research-based. Blue Star products, incredible brand. The products are based on research, science, the products work, trademark patent ingredients, and you can find all of the research just by scanning QR codes that are right on the back of the product. Thank you to Eric and Andy for their podcast. I think it's amazing and definitely give Blue Star Products a try. So just with you saying that, um, there's also kind of the flip side, like we were just talking about, like kind of the positive. Yeah, we give the nice fluffy stuff. Yeah, yeah, like the positive. But then you do get the guys that coach as you kind of touched on like strictly to get their kid in a good position or they feel like they can influence the the organization to get their kid in a favorable spot or or they just like the power or they're getting paid or whatever so maybe you can touch on some of those yeah you darker can, sides of it yeah, i guess you could see that coming a mile million miles away um a lot of them seem like good intentions and good ideas but um you, you can see that some guys coach just for their kid or like you said the power and uh, uh, control that they can have with their kid and and maybe managing where their kid gets to play and moving forward and then to me the one of the that's that's a bad one to me uh and the the other one that's equally as bad probably maybe even worse is the guys that have let's say a power tech like this yeah they run a business they run a business or they're doing it for the money and i've seen a lot of guys like when i was in the states there's one guy that was an assistant coach with me and i said so like he was a weird guy um i was just put in a weird situation there and uh, i said so what do you what what, yeah what else do you do for a living because he never talked right it was uh and he looked at me like i was nuts he goes hockey i go what what do you mean i coach hockey and then i found out that he coached four or five different teams making you know, charging people just go wherever the money was. And it's like, okay, that's, that actually explains this guy. So that's that to me, that's a tough one because now all of a sudden they, cause you can dress it up real good, right? Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to do all the, the training. Uh, you're going to, you know, I'm going to coach this team at a young level. I'm going to take them through five years and then I'm going to do clinics that you have to go to. I'm going to have extra practice and stuff like that. And it's like all self-serving stuff. You know, I, I, I shouldn't say all self-serving, but very much self-serving because if you said, well, let's go on the ice for these amount of times without charging me or making me feel like I have to go to one of your clinics now, then are you actually going to do it? Are you, do you want to help me that much? Do you want to help these guys that much? You just want to live your life on the ice. That's the one that, that bothers me a lot, but there's more and more prevalent. So like I coach you now I got a clinic every Saturday morning, even though the family might want to do something else. And that the dad goes, yeah, geez, I got to, don't want to go but the coach will probably be taking it out on my kids so i'm going to go to his clinics anyways and that's to me that's just like eh. you, i know and it's like even if like even if that's not your motivation just the optics of it like because we know so many guys that do that where it's like they they take a team and they rope them in and then for five years a place like ours we never see those kids because it's where, where, where we used to or we maybe we would have not and it doesn't matter from like a business perspective it's just an observation it's like where are those kids well, they feel like they're locked in with this person that coached their team or got a grip on them. And then it's like, oh, and by the way, I have all these extras yeah. now. And yeah, we have summer training. Yeah. 
It's right. like, well, you got your team in the wintertime. What, how much? <laughs> come exactly. on, man. Right. And, yeah. and, and that's control too, right? That's, absolutely. That's control. It's like, no, I, you're going to do it my way. I'm going to. Yeah. Know. And, and, and to be fair though, like there's a, there is a, a bit of a flip side to that too. Like that's not necessarily all bad. Like for example, if somebody like you looked at a, a team or an organization where it's like you're qualified and you're experienced and you are a good coach and you look and you're like, man, like I don't really want my kid to have to deal with this. So I'm going to coach. It's like, that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but then you do have some dads where they actually don't know anything, but they think the same thing. It's like, they think, Oh, I'm not going to let this bad stuff happen to my kid, but they actually don't know anything and can't be helpful. You know? So there's a, there is a bit of a flip side depending on the, the person that is going to be jumping in to do the coaching or do whatever. And even the, even the paying thing, like I know it's more and more common at, in youth hockey to have that. Like most teams have some kind of pay, pay for the coach, whatever. And, uh, I don't necessarily disagree with that as long as it's very transparent and um because you have to incentivize good people to come in right like someone who's super busy or has a job or has a whatever it's like you have to you do have to make it worth their time to a degree and usually money is the incentive for for good people that are in that industry if you're going to pull them away from something else that they should be doing you have to make it worth their time kind of thing you know oh for sure where do you draw the line i don't know but for sure for sure, for sure, for sure, coaches, especially if you're doing travel stuff, like you gotta have you gotta have expenses paid for because it shouldn't cost a coach money at in in this time of uh, the world. But to 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 go there and coach and make money, yeah. that's eh, whatever. Yeah, yeah, whatever. So I think the the kind of the next question and these these next two kind of tied together, um, maybe next three of them. Um, I don't. It takes it takes the self awareness again as a coach. Like these are things I think a lot of times in youth hockey, particularly, the coaches don't ask. So I want to be who are you coaching, and the second would be what do you want to accomplish with this particular group. Those are good questions to understand going in, and then the third kind of branching off of those two is what where is the limit of your knowledge as the coach? So what do you know right now? What do you need to learn in order to be an appropriate coach for this team at this age or whatever, you know? So I think it's important to, to dissect some of that stuff as the coach before you go into a situation. And the one example I've used before is my, he was it's so funny. So my the best coach I ever had to this point, well, not that I have, I have coaches in other areas now, but in hockey was Billy Bowler. He was the best coach I ever had. And he was phenomenal. Next after him was my, like U10 coach and it's not because he was really great at hockey it's because he was a really he was a great person and he tried to do that motivating make us better people yeah. appropriate appropriate and to his credit when I was I, I don't remember if it was 10 11 or whatever somewhere around there he coached us for like our first year of AAA or something like that and then he stopped coaching us because he said I cannot offer you guys anything anymore like I can't help you with hockey anymore I don't know enough I vividly remember that as a little kid I remember that being his reason why I stopped and whether it was or it wasn't like that's what he said at least and that speaks to him the character of him as a person and why I would think of him as being a great coach you can imagine the type of guy that would say I'd love to keep coaching you guys but I don't feel I can help you anymore beyond just you know the have fun good guy stuff so he steps down and the void was filled with like worse and worse coaches year after year. Like he, if he would have stayed, it would have been the best coach we would have had of the coaches we had up until I had Billy or whatever. Anyways, my point being, this guy knew where his, he was done. Like he knew where it's no longer appropriate for me to be the guy that helps. And I think a lot of coaches, especially in smaller centers where there's not maybe as much money flying around to attract, you know, experienced coaches that are really qualified it's real easy to just you know step in and have your arms crossed guy and i'm the coach that knows everything now and we talk to coaches around here all the time from like a double a triple a levels where they come in and have conversations with us and they're just like joe coach now and they actually don't know anything and they don't know how to help their guys and they don't study and they don't try to learn and and obviously younger less of that is necessary but as kids are you know 14 15 16 it's like you don't know any systems you don't know how to teach them positional play you can't you don't even have a team philosophy you don't know roles for your guys like these are things that should start to come into play and a lot of them just don't have it so i think those kind of those three questions it's like who you're coaching and what do you want to accomplish and then tied in with that is just like 
what about you, the limits on your knowledge? So maybe just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think I think the big one is who am I coaching? Like that's that's a great question that we came up with because, I mean, if you're NHL coach Bruce Cassidy, you just won a Stanley Cup and you're coaching a, a Pee Wee team, it's not it's a different level, different type of player. Um, so who am I coaching? That's it. Now it's a, a development. It's all about teaching them how to have fun. So who am I coaching? So if you're coaching like a, a low level or a, a very young group of kids, then it has to be appropriate to that. Like the X's and O's aren't the most important thing. And then even like, so let's just take an age of 12, 12 year old kid or 10, 12, let's say 12 year old kid. So at 12 years old, there's different, le- there's different levels of who am I coaching? You've got both from individuals and from a team standpoint. So who am I coaching at 12 years old? And if it's a triple A team, okay, that's one thing. But then what level of triple A is it? Like who, who triple A? So if you're c- coaching a small center where there's, you know, maybe 30 guys that try out and really 10 of them could play triple A somewhere else, that's still different than coaching the Toronto Marlies Pee Wee team or U- U13 team or U12 team, whatever it is. And that's different. So like, a really good team that can, a really good t- team from let's say uh, Toronto Marlies, you're probably going to be able to and should implement more uh, advanced systems or or drills and teaching philosophies because I'm going to just say that because of the talent level and uh, the seriousness of that organization, that's what's expected. So that that would make sense. But then don't forget that they are 12. Because they like, who am I teaching? You're still teaching 12 year olds. So there has to be an element of, of fun. Has to be an element of teaching. There has to be an element of uh, seriousness, but it's, and development. And then, so if you take that the same AAA team at, uh, let's say, use Chatham, Ontario, or Sudbury, Ontario, where the, like I said, you might get 30 guys try out, and you, you know you're hoping to field a decent team. Well, that's a different AAA level. Now you still want to teach like some sort of system so that you can compete and but your development is a whole different development model and your what comes easier to maybe uh, uh 15 kids from the toronto market triple a market uh it might not come as easy to a small town where you get 30 kids so that that teaching has to be a little bit different so who am i teaching as serious as a kid wants to be sometimes you're limited on on um uh, the philosophy or the systems that you can use. So, for example, if you're coaching a 12-year-old AAA team from Toronto, the Toronto Marlies, let's say, you can do some pretty advanced stuff because the skill level is going to be good, right? You can play fast. You can play riskier or whatever. Whereas if you want to give a chance to a like a small town, uh, Sudbury, Chatham, like whatever, something like that, then you're probably, unless you've got some just absolute studs on your team, you're probably going to have to give to give them a chance against the big teams. You're going to probably have to play a more defensive style, and you know, and you can build skill within that. And then, um, and then it's probably more of an encouraging thing, or like you know, teaching them to be underdogs and fighting through things. Like it is what it is. And then as you go to a, maybe a, a lesser level, let's say double A, A double A. And this is no slight on on those kids, but this is just from my experience. When you get kids that aren't playing, like trying to get to that next level or have the ability to get that next level, typically what happens is the seriousness of how they take the sport is is uh, part of the reason that they're they're not they they're not quite as committed. So if they're not quite as committed, and you're overly committed as a coach, then you're teaching the wrong audience. So what I mean by who you know or who am I coaching? It's like, okay, you could have committed kids that are just not talented, so you have to work with that. You could have non-committed kids that are talented, and then that's that's the issue there is teaching them maybe some commitment or whatever. And then you could have some kids that love to play, but they're just not serious about hockey, so you can't over-serious them. So you got to match them. But I think in any of those roles, try to lift them up a little bit. That's that's what I would say. So who and then and then within all that shit, <laughs> you can have uh, a really really poor team and have a really really good player. So for example, um, Denny Gore, right? He played on. You now he was very well coached by Kenny, but uh, he was a first round pick, eighth or eighth or tenth overall to the Owen Sound Attack, right? 
and he played on Chatham. And they didn't have a lot of people trying out. They had a decent team, but that that player is he's a he's a first round pick in the OHL. So there is some attention that on a, on a poor team that you might have to give them a little bit of extra here and tell them fight through things like you know playing on a playing on not the best team might be good for you later because you know if you go to if you go first round in the in the OHL especially in the first ten picks that kind of means that that team wasn't the best team last year so you're going to be in the same type of environment so how do you carry a team when you're a superstar right and then or then you see a kid that just works real hard that you can see maybe some tools coming and it's like okay how can i work with him to make him better so like who am i coaching you have the team and then that's why it's very very important to pull guys aside and identify passion uh talent stuff like that yeah i think that's starts to play into the individuals that we mentioned at the start of the podcast. Like there's that element too. Um, but before maybe you touch on that a little bit, kind of what you're talking about is the, I, I learned about this. I don't remember where I learned about this actually. You no, know, people say like you need, be, you're in the zone. You feel like you're in the zone. Um, that's actually, it's called the zone of proximal development, which is, I don't know if it was a psychologist. The zone of what? The zone of proximal development. And I, I forget who was the guy that, came up with it or coined it or whatever anyways um so when people say like they feel like they're in the zone it feels like you're in the perfect balance of something that's not too challenging where you can't do it but not so easy that you're bored and that's like the best place to be to learn things whatever and basically what you were saying if we could summarize that in one term is you want to put your team in that zone you know so where's like the collective consciousness or ability at with your team and you want to put that in that zone right? Where it's, it's just enough challenge for everybody where everybody will eventually be able to um, understand or integrate whatever you're trying to teach. And it's not such a joke that it's boring, where it's like you're doing the same practice every week or whatever, and there's no learning happening. So you want to try to find that and all those characteristics you outlined, that's what you're looking for to des- decide where that zone is. Where do I need to put my team so that they're in that zone? And then within that, going back to the individuals, maybe you have a kid that is an outlier that's way outside that zone. Either way, you know, so you have your team here and you got a, a kid that's way up here. So how are you going to tailor your coaching now to keep that kid engaged and keep him learning? You know, you still have to try to balance that situation. And then on the flip side, you got the kid that's maybe way too far behind, but you only had... 18 kids try out, you know? So how do you keep that kid engaged when it's, it's actually too much for him, you know, and you have to try to figure those things out. So it's important as a coach that you figure out what it is you're working with, who you're working with, and then you can kind of outline where they should be to put them in that, that perfect spot where they constantly feel like they're making progress, you know, and then, and then going to each individual kid, identifying some of their differences and then trying to figure out where to plug them on that spectrum to make sure that they're still getting some benefit from it too. And I think all those things are possible. Like it's not that it sounds like a lot to do as the coach, but it's actually not that difficult of a task in practice. It just takes a little bit of time, right? It just takes a little bit of commitment and conversations and talking to some of the kids to make sure, you know, you have a pulse on where everybody's at. And I think that the issue that a lot of coaches run into is they don't do that and they just dictate. It's like, this is what I think. And you guys will conform to this, you know, we've talked about the opposite side of that from the player side when you know the coach is dictating to you you kind of have to figure out how to play within those those rules even if you don't want to well now we're flipping the page onto the coach and saying that's not a great strategy it's like you need to be able to well work with the team you have yeah and and you know if you go back 20 years and more the dictator the dictator was the way it was you do this because but you'll hear if you ever listen to interviews with coaches you'll hear it very clearly like Mike, Mike Babcock went through that, right? Like he's, whether he, I mean, I'm sure he did, he's a very smart guy, but you know, he at some point became unrelatable to the players or his message was the tone of the, of his words were so strong that the message wasn't getting through. And um, so like he said, I just listened to him talk about it. He goes, yeah, I've learned. He goes like kids these days. And you'll hear this in every podcast or in every, any interview from coaches is like now, it's not the, it's not the same as it used to be. You don't just do it because I said so with your arms crossed, eyes crossed, ears crossed. It's now it's because kids want to know why. And that's a fair statement. And it's like, you know, old, really old school guys might say, well, that's shit, but it's a, it is what it is. And it's actually more effective. Why? And if 
we always say it all the time. If you know why you're doing something, you're probably going to do it better. Right. So, um, you know, I just looked at back in school, like I would ask that question to teachers. It wasn't being a jackass, just like Eric, uh, Mr. Eric, uh, what do we need to know this for? Because it's like, well, it's not really a good answer. It's not helping me because I was a Y guy. Yeah. You know, yeah, I was a Y sure. guy. Yeah, if you tell too. me, oh, because Andy, it's going to help your hockey career, right? That's individual coaching now. How? Well, knowing geography, let's say I just put pulling this one out. If you don't know where Edmonton is, wouldn't you like to know where Edmonton is on the map? So when you're travel, whatever, or when you pack your clothes to go play in Edmonton, you need a toque or whatever. Oh, okay. That would make sense to me. I got to find out where Edmonton is on the map or whatever. Right. Why do I need this math? Because, oh, when you make all that money, when you play hockey, you're gonna ha- you're gonna have to know where to put the your savings, all that savings, so you can buy a Porsche. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I, I remember that my dad used this example too. He said a, a couple teachers. I could be blending the stories, but whatever. He said that in their math class, the one uh, teacher would use uh, the stats of baseball players to do math questions in in class because now a lot of him and his buddies really like baseball, so then now they're paying attention. Because they're talking about a baseball player that they like and batting averages or whatever, and using that to do questions. It's like that's more interesting, you know. That's to your point, the individual piece of it. Or he had a the music teacher where he could bring in a song that he liked, and they would analyze that song, you know. So he would bring in like uh, Black Dog by Led Zeppelin into their music class at school, and now I'm interested in learning about this because that's a sweet song. I like that song, you know. And that's those are good strategies. Yeah. Um, well, and it goes down to this, right? Like if you don't, if you don't do stuff like that, if you just dictate, then you're not necessarily making friends. Mm-hmm. You don't, I'm not saying you have to make friends, but people, you want the buy-in, man. That's how pe- you get the yeah, buy-in. And, and people, we say it all the time. People don't know how much you don't care how much, you know, they want to know how much you care about them. Yeah. For and sure. That's very, very important to get results. Yeah. One thing you mentioned was, uh, like how serious do we need to be? And I, th- I want to highlight that again for, for another minute because I think, uh, like I said, and then you said, you get a lot of the everything crossed coach that I'm just Joe coach and I know everything, uh, serious guy. And it's not that that's never appropriate, but you have to be able to read the play. So I, I just want to highlight that again. If you have a t- team of kids that they're there to have fun and you're like military coach, Joe serious, like remember, you had a, a consult with uh, a dad that was talking about the coach on their team is just like, he's too much. Like he's, he, I forget exactly what he said. If they he yells, I don't know if he yells too much or he's too intense or something. Yeah. Something like that, where he, the guy's like just always on and the kids are young. I forget how old they were, but just whatever it was. And the guy's just like, I feel like this is not good now for the kids. You know, like, I feel like it's not good. And even though like he, he, in the same breath, he says, like, he really liked the coach. He's like, I don't want to go to a new coach. Like, I like this coach, but it's just too much. And so this guy, here's, uh, if you take this coach now, it's like, okay, he's, his intentions are good. He's trying to do a good thing, but he's acting like they're the Red Wings. Like, the expectations are too high for eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds or whatever. You know, and there's a fine line between, you know, expecting them to listen and follow instructions. And it's like, they're eight. Like they're gonna mess up everything, right? and and understanding the audience, mistakes. right? Yeah. So it's important that you're not you're not too too serious. Um, well, we have another that. example of that is we had the one guy here. He was talking to me, and he thinks he's Joe Coach, and he's coaching uh, an A level, eighteen U, eighteen U. And I know the the two three best players on the team. The, the best player on that team does not care about hockey, just likes to, wants to play. That's the point, that he just wants to play. And there's nobody on this team that's going anywhere. Not a chance. And they don't want to. They're playing for fun. And this guy is like Joe serious about – and it, it, it's – see, the here's, the here's the fine line. It's okay to be Joe serious about – like if this is your philosophy, that when – right now, I'm, I'm the coach that if you're going to do something well, or if you're going to do something, you're going to do it well. If we're going to play hockey, we're going to play it the right way. We're going to have a work ethic. You can't be late, all those kind of things. That's fine. That's fine. But his is about, he's, his approach is he's coming across like, you guys, if you don't listen to me, you're not going anywhere. Well, you have lost them. And they tell me, they say, it's just such a joke. Yeah. Guy's an idiot. Because they don't articulate like that, but they're like, just want to have fun. Yeah, I don't care. You, know, you got to warm up at this exact time. It's like, you don't understand your audience. You got kids that 
are coming in. They, they If they can get here five minutes, get dressed and go to the game, that's what they want to do. But this guy wants the proper warm-up, this, that, the other thing. But he's approaching it like you aren't going to be a hockey player without my help. And, you, you know, you're not going anywhere. If you don't start doing this, you need to take this seriously. But you're that's the wrong audience. That's the wrong audience. You, you need to be coaching U15, U16, U18, whatever, triple A or private academy or something like that where people are like, I want to be a hockey player. But the message from the kids are like, I don't care. And we have too many practices and, and all that kind of stuff. It's like, so that's what I'm saying is who am I coaching? Because you could be like that guy. Could, let's say he is an actual really good coach, X's and O's, and can win and stuff. They don't care. Just put me on the line. We know who the best guys are. Just put us out. And and I think this is kind of branches into my next point. Like we're talking about, you know, things can start to get out of hand. And where I see a lot of that happening at younger and younger levels now is with like the evaluation process and like training camps and those types of things. It's kind of like you're bringing the like junior hockey structure of how those teams are run down to younger and younger levels. So it's like the coaches are like looking at 10 year olds in the summertime or, or at least parents think they are, or they're using spring hockey as a secret tryout for their triple a team. And then they have a week long training camp where it's like a super intensive and things are just starting to get out of, out of hand a little bit for, for the, again, for like, we're talking age appropriate, right? If you're running a, uh, U16 AAA team in their draft year, maybe that's a little bit different than the 11 year olds and you can start to ramp it up appropriately. But I find this, it's like there's one mentality only, you know, and it's we need to be the best team possible. And that means we need to be on the ice every day and doing all these extra workouts. And you need to be at this gate and this gate and this gate. And you need this gear and you have to, we need to look like a team. We need to act like a team. We need to be like a team. And we're going to do that all year round so that we're the best. And I find that mentality is becoming more and more prevalent, even though it's ineffective and not appropriate, even at the younger levels. Like right now, they got the brick tournament going on right now, or it was going on or whatever recently. I just saw some posts about it. And I'm looking at these kids and like they're putting highlights of the games. And what a cool, like I'm not, I'm not trying to shit talk the brick tournament. Like what a great experience for the kids. Like it's super cool. It's run like top notch, right? The kids are all decked out and the kids are all great players and whatever. But then it's like, they're 10 you know or they're 11 however old they are you know so it's like do we need is this is this necessary like should it be your goal as an 11 year old to play in the brick tournament like is that is that an appropriate thing so i want to talk about that a little bit is like the the maybe evaluation process and the use of training camps um by coaches younger and younger not that it's all bad either like talking about like where it's good where it's not so let's say to put, make it a more clear question, if you were running, um, let's say whatever tryouts, evaluations, training camp, the differences between maybe kids that are 12 and kids that are 16, junior, whatever, like where would you highlight some what's appropriate versus not or what you need to do versus not? What would you do? Let's say yeah, that, that's, that's, coach. that's fine. What would I do? Yeah. Winters for you, for the kids, me and the kids, summers for themselves. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Um, do you have to do some prep? Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, no. Um, it's it's it, it, it's becoming crazy. Um, so when I had the U6, when I had Charlie's team, it was the, the, the organization started the ice on, let's say, October 3rd, for just for numbers. And that's when we started, man. October 3rd. I'm not taking a team of eight or nine year old kids in the summertime, right? In the summertime, taking them away from being a kid or maybe a vacation or a camping trip or swimming party or anything like that so that I can get these eight and nine year old kids ready for the season. Season starts October 3rd. We got six months of this. We'll be fine. We'll be fine. And then the kids that want to, this is the important thing, the kids that want to go out all summer, and not go on vacation or go on the ice three times a week or every day or whatever, or shoot pucks and live hockey, they're going to do that anyways. And the other kids are just ruining their summer. And maybe they get to the rink and they like it, but in the summertime, let them be kids. That's 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 how I am. If you want to go work out and stuff, go do it. Now as you get to... Okay, wait, sorry. So, yep. so let's say now 
because on every team, I'm sure there's a spectrum of interest level, right? So let's say you have the 12 year old triple A team and your philosophy as coach is, okay, summertime, you do you, I'll see you in September or whatever. Let's say you get five, six parents that maybe call you or email you, or they say something to you about, Hey, like, I feel like it'd be really good if we got some, like the team together to do some skates. Like, I don't know if you'd be willing to coordinate that or something. Are you talking me as me with my business or just no, no, me? Just okay. like the coach. Like okay. they just say to the coach, yeah. like, it'd be nice if we got, had some skates with the kids. Like we could go do these other camps, but it'd be cool if we got the team together a little bit early to, to do some skates. What, what's your answer for that? Yeah. My answer is the same. Okay. So you, you are really, really serious about hockey. Triple A or not, I don't give a shit. You're you're real serious about hockey. Um, your kids may be, but it sounds like you are motivated parent or motivated kids, because you're all worried about the team dynamic in July. That's that's on you, man. Right. Uh, so so, why the hell should I take three or four or five kids that really want to get on the ice and think that the team needs some stuff and ruin? 10 or not ruin, but force that on five or 10 other people. That's to me, summertime is your time. It's like the NHL, the OHL has policies, college, they have policies where like we got some guys that, that went to their schools in the, in the U S at the NCAA school, St. Cloud, different places. And the coaches aren't allowed on the ice. It's captain's practice. So if you want to come, it's captain's practice. I don't know how much force that is, but the coaches can't go anywhere near it for a reason, man. The OHL, you can't have your hands on the kids in the summertime. There's a, it ends on the last playoff day. You have you're allowed to have your development camp, your training camp, and everything else. There's you you can't do it. The NHL has a collective a bargaining agreement to keep people away. So why should it be any different for kids? And I'm not. It, why should it be different? I'm not even trying to compare the two. But to me, it's summertime, man. Go have summer. And why is it fair? Why why is it fair like if you're playing lacrosse or baseball so why should why should I make my summer training program that cuz I'm your coach more important than your baseball team or your soccer team or your family vacation don't make me feel guilty because you're nuts we'll be fine everyone is going to be just fine in my opinion now if I now the, the one year that I coached or the two years I coached in the states it was U16 and they were like, okay, so when are we going to start skating? I said, well, when does it start, man? September. Okay. So let's say it's September 1st. Okay. So maybe the week before or something. Like, oh, I thought we maybe do like a month or something. I said, it's freaking August. I said, number one, I don't, they're going to get sick of me as a coach. I promise you. Like, promise you. I could be the best coach ever, the everyone's best friend. At some point, they're just going to say, can you please shut up? Stop with your positivity or your negativity or whatever. Just stop. Right? So you got X amount of time to coach. So what we did, I made a little bit of a um, concession. Nice. I don't know if that's the yeah, word. Could be. Um, and I said, okay, how about the week before? The week before, we'll do a, a, like a, a mini camp for three, four days. So I went to the states and we did that, and they and it was nice. The team and, and they said, and then we could get the socks, jerseys, and all that stuff taken care of. I said, okay, that's fine shorts and stuff and we did like a, it was a couple hours a day and it was it was fine and, and sorry that was u16 so that's that's still let's draft your kids so that's the same philosophy dude dude, yeah. dude let, let's put it in perspective you can coach at all you it, okay if you're coaching a triple a team you should be able to coach a little bit if you can coach at all you know what a triple a kid is doing in the summertime you actually I'll, what are they doing in the summertime skating working out playing another sport yeah, but Hang most, family, most likely they didn't drop, like in today's day and age, they didn't drop uh, hockey in March or April when it was over and never touched the blades until uh, September. That's maybe three kids in the whole world do that now. So you know they're skating, they're doing stuff. So if I can't take, a, if I'm coaching AAA, and most likely if I had these, not most likely, if I had these kids the year before or the year before and the year before, if I can't take those kids in two, three practices and just go over our breakouts, our four checks, our PK, like, and get them on some sort of page in a week or three practices. Well, right. Okay. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. You've been sure. skating all year. Yeah, what is the extra time? There, gonna do? Like, yeah. what do you need the training camp for? It's like, yeah. for what? Was well, it funny? As and, and do what you want. But I'm just saying like, from you're asking me if I'm a coach, it's like, and, I, and, and by the way, I want to enjoy my life too. 
but that's like you can't coach if you have, if you need three weeks to prepare them for a freaking uh and or all summer and then the kids that want to work out are going to work out like here's the thing it's like what we said in one of our podcasts before when when if your kid is actually a real hockey player and ends up getting a scholarship or ends up going to the OHL or moving away to play hockey, the stuff that you put your thumb on all the time, you need to work out, you need to do this, you got to train. When you're not there, they're going to be who they are. So if they can't do a, a workout in the summertime on their own, then that's that's on them, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. I was talking to a coach the other day, and I think he's coaching a, a literally a U10 team. And he was talking about how like it's impossible to organize anything with the like parents and players and whatever because there's so much going on. I'm like, well, yeah, no shit. I'm like, no shit, because you are sched- trying to schedule two, three skates a week. They have two or that, three that work in your time frame. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. That work for you. Yeah. And then that kid also plays lacrosse or soccer or baseball or whatever. They also are trying to go on vacation. They also have two other kids in the family. They also have this and this and this and this and this. And it's like, yeah, no shit. You can't schedule anything. Obviously, because every not only are you doing it, all their other coaches are doing the same thing you're doing at the same yeah. time. And they're going to a skating coach yeah, or a right? skills coach. So, so it's and, and this is where I'm talking getting back to like just things getting off the rails. It's like that's why I love I love when you can put some sense to the situation, having been through it and seen the development curve and how like it doesn't hurt you to not be there. You know, I was t- I was talking to uh to Adam Jeffrey the other day and like so th- for, if anybody that doesn't know Adam Jeffrey he goes to RIT he's got division one from he played in BC for a year but basically from Leamington he was got, got um recruited and so he tore both of his Achilles at 19 or 18 and 18, 19, 19 yeah. so he tore had one torn and then came back and then had the other one torn and he, so he, for probably like at least a year and a half, it was like minimal, minimal skating, minimal ho- hockey. So now you're thinking at 18, 19 years old, like, wow, what a horrible time for that to happen. He's going to be so far behind in a year and a half now because he can't skate. And guess what? He gets on the ice after he's recovered. And within, let's say, three months of intensely being back at hockey, He's right back to where he was and then some. And that, I talked to their strength coach in the summertime, and they were saying the same thing from the start of the season to the end of the season, like what an improvement he had uh, in terms of his play for their team. And so all these people are like, you know, you get kids, you use this example, like you break a bone and you're out for six weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. You didn't touch the ice. Hockey's not over. Yeah. Like your hockey didn't just fall out of your ear. No. Like you just, you didn't just lose it all now. No. no. Right. And so I think people would do well to understand that perspective and coaches would do well to understand that perspective. Like what are the extra four weeks of skates twice a week going to do? Yeah. Like what does that well, you know, accomplish? But, but then you have to also measure it. And this is where I think a lot of people do it out of ignorance and making sure I knew people, under, people that think ignorant means being rude. I mean, ignorance, like lack of knowledge, ignorance. Um, a coach might have all these things scheduled, but like if you're Joe serious hockey player, and you are have your own trainer, and you're doing a skills coach or whatever, whatever, you're doing your training in the summertime. You're not doing. I'm not doing you a favor by bringing you in this place because I said so to do an extra workout. Because now you don't know what I did all week. So if I if I if I come here and you're you know maybe you're doing a military style workout where it's squats, push ups, pull ups, squats, push ups, push ups, pull ups, or running. 5k or whatever it is that could be totally opposite what that you've paid someone to train your body for so it's like you're not helping you're actually hurting and um and i remember when when charlie's coaches used to have stuff on a monday night or a thursday night in the summertime i'd just be like are you come on man like i don't even want i don't want to drive him there and he doesn't need it you don't know what we do in a day man yeah exactly um well, I think that's that's basically covers kind of the, or I guess sets the the stage for the next few episodes that we're gonna do. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to kind of close on just to, to tee up the the rest of the series, or do you feel like the, I feel like we kind of covered a little bit of everything we're gonna go into in more detail? 
I'm, I'm good. Yeah, you're good. I'm good. So the next, the next few, we're going to talk about, like I said, we touched on all these things, but the, the separate episodes are going to do, uh, like coaching that's age appropriate will be the next one. Um, and then identifying what you have or building your team. So that'll include like team philosophies and those kinds of things. And then how to coach individuals on a team, uh, as opposed to just the team structure. And then we'll talk, I'm, I'm looking forward to this one. It's coaching in a practice or coaching during the game and like strategies for that. And then at the end, we'll talk about like conflicts with parents and players and all things that come up. Yeah. Coaching. All the colorful things that, um, will cause all the controversy. So, uh, the next few weeks we're going to be covering all this stuff. So for guys, people that are members online, um, we're going to do the same kind of question and answer thing again. So I'll have something set up on, uh, on the website when you log in where you can drop us questions and at the end we'll do like a wrap up Q&A thing to touch on any questions that that people have so um hopefully that's kind of interesting enough to set set the table so next week we'll start going to that kind of stuff uh i'm gonna shut it off now good good yep. okay see you guys next week